Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. This does that as well. Thanks very, for very cool. Me. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, maybe, I mean, we've talked we've talked about this topic a little bit in other episodes, but uh Let's maybe just start out with the basics. So, I mean, what's your definition um, of blended learning? Or do you have just one? I don't think there is just one, actually. I think learning is a multifaceted dice. It's not a two-sided coin. It's not, uh, you know, just having face-to-face -face and plugging in digital. Or it's not just having in-person and then plugging in a book. Um, is actually the way I describe it. I'm going to read it, actually, for you <laughs> from the book. Um, is it weird to quote yourself out of your own book? I don't know. But <laughs> no. Uh, because this is the one thing that comes up so many times and uh, in fact I don't even call it blended I call it blending and because it's active it's an active verb that you constantly need to be looking at for the individuals involved what is the best solution that they need and so let me read you what I think um, when it comes to uh, blending I think in learning and development, we must be advocates of the right solution for the right problem, for the right people, at the right time, for the right reasons, delivered in the right way. That's my take, uh, and that's what I try and offer my clients, and uh, I genuinely believe that to be true. Very cool. It's Thoughts? not even a hot take. It's just it's <laughs> the way it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would argue with that. So it's what we're all trying to do. And um, I think one of the things that's fun to hear is um, transitioning. I mean, maybe this is a weird place to start, but um, you know, we have talked about it in the past before. And I think, um, you know, blending learning has been around for a little while when, you know, typically people start off with just having very unblended <laughs> learning, <laughs> non-blending learning. What, what, is it, what does it typically look like when somebody comes to you and they're wanting to blend their learning? Is it like a need? And then you tell them, well, blending the learning would help. And they go, oh, I didn't think of that. Or do they typically come to you going knowing they want to finally blend their learning and they ask for help? I think post-pandemic, it's the latter. Post-pandemic, people have realized that we can't offer one way. Um, and so it tends to be, uh, you know, coming to me and saying, how do we create a program which is blended? Um, but actually, I don't even start there. I think starting with the solution is the wrong place to start. You need to start with the problem that you're trying to solve. And even back from that, you need to start with the strategy of the organization. What's the organization trying to achieve? What's the barrier or the problem that's being caused? Um, and then we get to a solution. So some people are quite surprised when they look at the book and they think, well, Michelle, you don't even, you know, it's a learning and development handbook. You don't even talk about learning really mm -hmm. until later on in the chapters. You know, I've got chapters around stakeholder engagement. I've got chapters around strategic intent, uh, you know, chapters around consultative learning and development, because we need to do those stages in order to really understand what is the solution? What does that, that overall blending approach look like in that context? for those people for that problem and it might look like it for for one set of people different than another I'm giving us uh, an example of um there's a furniture store very very well world famous um, that a try in one particular um, branch they try and recruit people who've got learning difficulties and they're, they're really the, the, the store manager is really passionate about that and so they they have to offer l d which looks different than in the other stores in that network um, because people who are putting together, for example, uh, the furniture, following line by line written instructions, very difficult for them. So they have a QR code, they put their mobile phone over the QR code, up comes a video how to put together that piece of furniture. So that blend is an entirely different offer than somebody who, um, you know, would be struggling in other ways. Now, you could use that same example for somebody who has English as a second language. So they're just following along the video. So I'm always about what's the blend that needs to be for the problem and the people that you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that example that you listed, that will help many folks because many people will just find it easier to watch a video than, um, you know, written instructions, period, w with or without formal, you know, learning difficulties or, or what have you too. So, yeah, very cool. Um, 
Is, is there, I have to, just a quick follow-up question, not to cut you off there, Chris. I don't know if you, you had one on the tip of your tongue, but I was no. thinking, do you have, do you, um, do you often get any pushback, right? When they, when they come to you and, and, you know, they want training and you say, well, no, let's hold on a second. Let's go back another step and let's talk about the business and all of that. Do you ever get that look yeah. from people? Like, why do we have to go through this process? I, I already know what I want and I'm kind of yeah. coming to you for that. And now you're making me go through this stuff that I go, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> You, you know it. You've been there yourself. I can hear it in your voice. Uh, so you've got two choices at that point, haven't you? You've got the choice which goes, oh, sure, yeah, you know everything. Absolutely. You're brilliant. You, you, you know, you're a salesperson and you're coming to me and telling me, put my guys on a sales course for the 20th time. Never questioning why it's not worked in the first place. So you could do that. I don't do that. Uh, the other option is to really investigate success. Okay, great. Yeah, you want you want us to run a, a program and, you know, you just want people in a classroom for five days consecutively because they're missing it. You know, they want the networking. They miss the biscuits, the, the cookies. Uh, you know, they miss all of that stuff. So fine, but talk to me about what success looks like. Talk to me about what will have changed as a result. What's the behaviours that will be different? What's the actions and outcomes that will be different? And at that point... You start, you know, you start opening a conversation in which you can be a little bit more consultative. So when they, for example, describe, well, you know, I want my guys to all sell six more units a month. You know, OK, so you've got a number there, six. How many are they selling now? Well, they're selling only four. OK, so we've got an uplift of two. How do you know that that course is going to do anything for them? How do, How's five days in a classroom going to make any change? You talk me through what success looks like. At that point, they can start to realize you're there to help and not to hinder. Um, and so you can have a lot more of a consultative conversation and start saying, well, how are we going to check that two uplift? What could we do? You know, what about mentoring? Have you thought about putting that one in there? So you can have your classroom. If that's what you want to pay for, your budget, not mine, go for it. But actually, I'm going to help you to, to blend across uh, different types of opportunity. Because it's so true, isn't it? We, we do love the biscuits, the cookies. We do love the, the, the interaction. We do love the networking. Yeah. But that's not necessarily where the learning is. That's not where the knowledge transfer is taking place. That's that's where the sense making could take take place instead. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we could jump in and talk about some of the, I guess, your favorite, um, you know, examples of, of putting this in action. Some from you know from some of your own experiences. Yeah, I want to talk to you about uh, girl guiding. So Girl Scouts in in uh, your side of the pond. Girl guiding. Uh, um, traditionally in the UK, 100 years old, only ever done face-to-face, -face. 638 trainers, volunteer trainers, and 100,000 plus volunteers. Now you do the math on that. That's quite a lot of people that you're responsible for. So yeah. the, the consequence was two things. The consequence was that somebody would go through the initial training period when they become a volunteer and never do anything more again because they couldn't really get access. You know, the numbers weren't there. There wasn't enough training uh, available for everybody. Um, and consequently, you ended up with um, a sort of a set in time. People, volunteers were girl guiding leaders in the time that they learned. They didn't move forward. They never progressed. There was no, you know, sort of development beyond that point in time, which caused a problem to the girls because the girls, of course, are are not the same as when you learn to be a guide leader in 1965, you know, <laughs> they've moved on. The second consequence of that is, is just generally the pressure on those 638 trainers. That's a lot of people who are coming through, funneling through, but they also were very powerful, all powerful, because everybody who was a volunteer came through those people. Now, don't get me wrong, they're all lovely, all meaningful, trying to do the right thing, um, but it, it's just a bottleneck. So somebody would come in as a volunteer and then they wouldn't learn how to be a volunteer for potentially some months. And mm. then what do they do in the meantime? So there were these were the barriers. These are the problems that we needed to solve. Now, I was a volunteer and I became um, the, the head of learning, for want of a better phrase, uh, at Girl Guiding to solve some of these challenges. Um, and I was very, very conscious of the history very conscious of the uh, the endeavors that volunteers are making you don't want to annoy or frustrate your volunteers any one of you that works in the third sector you'll know exactly what i'm talking about you need these people yeah. and they need to come with you so we really started a lot of consultation with them you know what frustrates you what what's what the worst situation for you and some of the things were they would they would put together a really great package uh, of learning they would turn up you know on a saturday morning giving away half a day of their time and two people would turn up 
you know it's so frustrating for them that they put all that effort in for two people so reaching more people was one of the first problems that we wanted to solve and then the second problem we wanted to solve was of course this issue of how do we keep people warm how do we get them to learning quicker than waiting to to meet with a human um, and so digital was clearly part of the solution here. But how do we get to a full digital uh, package from having had nothing for 100 years? Um, and so we started with yeah. one option. Um, and we started with, uh, with webinar because it felt like this. It felt like I'm talking to you. You mm. might be millions of miles away from me, but actually, you know, you guys are in a room with me and we're chatting together. Um, yeah. And so we started there. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I should add, we started there and we started to encourage some of those 638 trainers to upskill themselves and become webinar trainers. And it was a real pleasure to train. We've now got 300 of them, um, of, of that group, who are now webinar trainers. So we, the, two things happened with that. We, we tried something. We said, this is an experiment. Have a go. And we had some willing people to have a go. But we also be, uh, you know, were able to change the narrative. So the narrative was previously, this is what we always do. We always do face-to-face. -face. It's, it's how we connect. It's really important to us to now we do face-to-face -face in a slightly different way. So the, the narrative that I sold into the board was adding to, not taking away. So we didn't take away what we had. If you want to do face-to-face, -face, carry on. But actually, we're going to add to that provision with, um, you know, as I say, webinars to start with. Once we prove concept around that and we got more and more people in, involved and interested, better feedback, people were saying things like, I've got a young baby. I would never drive, you know, two hours to go to a girl guiding training because I wouldn't want to leave my child for that time. Um, you know, but on a webinar, I'm, I've been feeding my baby the whole way through. This is just <laughs> amazing, you know. So remembering who your audience is. Remember I said to you earlier about it's about the people and the problems. So we had the problems, but the people involved in that, their volunteers, were asking them to give up even more time to learn. Um, and that's not what they really signed up for. They signed up to work with the girls. Mm -hmm. um, and so making that as easy as possible. So we ended up then proving concept, being able to get engagement around different ways of learning. And then we could plug in other stuff. So we plugged in a, a learning management system, which might sound old fashioned um, potentially, but actually you've got to move with the organization and the time that the organization sure. is at. So it was absolutely the right thing to do for girl guiding. And it's really taken them into a, an entirely different digital direction. So, yeah, all of the things I said earlier, you know, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What's the right way of doing that for the right people at the right time and, and bit by bit? But the narrative is really important. How you sell it or how you talk about it, how you change the stories, mm -hmm. that's what really gets people engaged, I think. Yeah. Um, and I feel that we're, we're, we're introducing maybe an extra theme to the, to the to today but in in the uk do the guides also sell cookies or biscuits for fundraising no no not see, at all see over no. here <laughs> and so so my brain the canadian north american brain is going and hey and since they're girl guides they've got a free supply of biscuits anyway even if they're not in face-to-face <laughs> -face. but i guess no not. sadly <clears throat> not sadly not <laughs> yeah. there would be all different kinds of cookies i think they would you guys would be making different cookies than what we have probably we, but there's it another is, rabbit hole it, it is mentioned in the book about <laughs> learning and development it's not all about the biscuits but actually <laughs> <laughs> they're very important they are very important but they have their place and i have to, I, I, in digitizing i've done this before i've sent out i've posted to my participants a tea bag and some biscuits, mm. because if that's what's important, you know, let's actually have that in a digital way. So we pause, we stop halfway through the session when we're online and we're like, you know, what cookies did you get? What biscuits did you get? And we actually have a physical online tea break together um, because those things are important, aren't they? It's important. They, to, to as much as we joke about it. Yeah, they absolutely are. And I think, you know, th those, uh, those folks in our industry that talk about the science of learning and all of that kind of stuff, I think we could actually probably find some science around that too. You know, when people feel comfortable and relaxed, they're more open and willing to learn. If they're stressed out and anxious, like all of the learning things that go on in your brain shut down and you're in fight or flight mode, you know, and you don't want people to be that way. So helping them, you know, relax, 
and yeah. and you know consume the content actually is part of our job and if it takes biscuits and mm -hmm. coffee thank you very much paul for dropping that in there it's not just about the biscuits the coffee is important too <laughs> or the tea as uh, as the case may be um all that stuff but works Paul, paul's absolutely right in that that if people haven't, when you're in a face-to-face -face setting, the food is rubbish. When you, you know, do your happy sheet at the end, please don't do those. But that, that's what you get, isn't it? Oh, yeah, the coffee was trash. Um, <laughs> I, I personally am <clears throat> quite fussy about my coffee. And I like it frothy and I like chocolate on top. And, you know, I'm quite fussy about it. And when I go to somewhere and it's like, oh, trash coffee. Um, so it, it's meeting those base level needs. Um, and to be honest, it if that's what people are getting together for, Call it what it is, call it networking, yeah. build it into the blend, call it sense making. You know, there's nothing better in a blend, I think, where the knowledge transfer happens in a way that suits the individual. So the same content pushed out in a variety of ways. So it might be a video with a transcript. So people who want to read can read, people who want to watch can watch um, and then come together either online or physically to say, well, how does that apply to my context? How does that apply to what I need to do? Um, you know, what can I do differently or, or do that sense making piece? And that is a much more effective than the sales guy. Come on, send my guys on a training course. I've not spent my budget yet. <laughs> yeah. <My role. laughs> yeah. My, one of my favorite stories, and this actually was way back in the, probably the nineties, uh, during the whole dot com boom, a company called knowledge net had a bunch of content and their courses were, they were self-paced e-learning courses that they were selling. But when you ordered the course or decided to pay for it, whatever, when the company bought a bundle of it or whatnot, if if you were one of the attendees, you would get a box in the mail before your session started because they, it was um, you you did have a start and a, and a finish time. So some of it was self paced, some of it was was virtual, and inside of the package was popcorn uh, and um, just some other little goodies and like a, a guide, a technical guide. If you have trouble connecting, you know, things like that, just like, like a performance support piece. And then they had a, a roll of um, that yellow emergency tape, you know, that uh, people have that you were instructed to put on the door of your cube. And that said something to the effect of like learning in progress, do not disturb or something like that. And so you were supposed to tape that all over the entryway to your cubicle. And uh, so it, a couple of things. One, I thought it was very clever. Two, they knew their audience and, uh, you know, they were very sort of hands on. And, and oddly enough, people loved that about taking those courses, getting that box. It was also a reminder that, hey, you've got some training coming up. Here's the box to prepare you for it. So I always thought that was a pretty cool idea. I totally and utterly agree. I've sent out puzzles before. I've sent out, I'm loving the idea from Craig in the chat there about the headsets. We did that for all the girl guiding webinar trainers because they'd never done anything online before. You know, some of them ah. didn't even have computers. So we had to look at how can we get, um, you know, supply of, of machines. Uh, but yeah, I'm to I've never done the tape thing before, but I've done caps. So when we were in offices, uh, you know, I'm wearing the cap, I'm wearing the learning cap. It's a real visual clue for people not to be disturbed, but also for managers to say, hey, what were you what were you learning? You know, how, how can I help you with that? Mm. Um, and I would be as L&D, uh, global head of L&D, I would be checking in on the managers, not on the individuals, because it's mm. the managers who actually give the permission for that learning to embed. And I think that this is where the blend falls down, because if managers send you away on a course, it's not their responsibility is the perception, but actually right. it is their responsibility. The application of the learning, howsoever the learning is consumed, has to be given express permission. Now, one of the frameworks that I put in the book is EPC, Environment, Permission and Culture because the environment of the learning is really important, whether that's a physical classroom, whether it's like this. I know some people are getting a bit of a hiss today from, from me. We don't know why, we, we tested it beforehand, but that will detract a little bit from their experience. And so these are the things that we need to address to make sure that the learning environment is right. I had one client once who bought a software as a service uh, platform and um, they sent me in as a consultant to embed it and to help them use it and whatever and the first day I arrived I'm like well where's your equipment like how are you going to help help people access this stuff and they were a retailer and they said oh we're going to use our tills and I looked at the tills I'm like are they windows 
No, they're DOS based. <laughs> Dude, game over. I'm going home. Like nobody had thought about the environment in which they're going to learn. C crazy. prompt colon backslash learn. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's just like, how is this even happening? How did nobody have this conversation before they actually bought this product? It was just nuts. But that's the problem. So we need to think about the environment. And, and you know, I'm, this is why I'm really attracted to your story about the tape. Because you're right, if you're sitting there, someone's coming and, and you know, my kids yeah. wander through my office. I'm like, I have a sticker on my door, live, you know, no enter. They're right, yeah. They don't look, do they? So we've got to think about these things. We've got to think about the express permission to learn as well. So mm. it's no good creating a beautiful blended program, videos and you know things to read and sending people books in the post and stuff. If somebody sitting reading a book at their desk, um, you know, would just get stared at by everyone, like what what are they doing? Like are they working? Are they doing work? Like, is this work? What are they doing? So we just need to be super clear with the permission piece. And this is where I think managers, line managers have got a really big role to play. It's They shouldn't abdicate L&D to the individual and to the L&D department. They should be active in, I've got a problem that I'm trying to solve here. You know, this person needs to upskill or this person needs to, um, you know, to be better at their job um, or, or we want to prepare them for succession planning. They need to have a role in that. And this all speaks to the culture and the learning culture that's within your organization. Mm -hmm. um, so I find it really fascinating that people will do these things. You know, they'll send people off on courses and just expect that it's, you know, I call it an injection of education. You're cured, aren't you? But <laughs> we all know injections wear off, don't they? <laughs> we have learned that. Yes, o open head, insert learning, <laughs> done. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Um, one, just to circle back to, you know, um, part of what you were saying, you know, when we got started and you were asking, uh, suggesting that, you know, asking what does success look like, etc. cetera. Um, something that that's then automatically, I think, embedded in a process like this is, is the measurement process, right? The ROI. Um, you're no longer concerning yourself about the, um, the time in course and the 80% pass score on the 10 question, 10 question quiz. Um, you're, 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 you know, then setting yourself up to be able to measure, did these totally you know, other, did this problem get solved? Oh, we want to sell six. Did people sell six? Cool. That's, oh, turns out some of them actually sold seven, you, you know, et cetera, which um, as, as for the folks, like you know, um, in, in the departments that often have to, you know, that are often putting the learning together and not necessarily seen as um, profit centers for it's, you know, whatever, um, that, that, that helps reinforce the value, you know, of, of what we can bring to a situation when we're able to bring those, those metrics and say, Hey, this was the problem. Here's the results after six months or, yeah. or whatever, et cetera, to be able to, um, to reinforce that, you know, that we do bring value to the organization. Chris, I think that is such an important point to hammer home because one of the challenges when you just react to my guys need a sales course is you have got no way of proving the value that you're adding and the chances are they've been on several sales courses before and nothing's happened because of exactly this whereas when you're really plugging learning design into a problem in a business especially a problem that's rooted in a, a uh, the strategy of the business you've got a direct link back to prove value and i think at the moment when l d is potentially an easy target in times of economic hardship oh, well, we need to cut budgets. Yeah, that training department, let's slash and burn. You know, they just spend it all on cookies and, and you know, it's not, there's no value being being added at all. Whereas when- And they've got bad coffee besides, so. Yeah, yeah. They should be increasing our budgets for better coffee and cookies. Better coffee. <laughs> My point is that, <laughs> My point is not that. My point is that actually, I think when we don't invest in our people in times of economic hardship, we are actually setting our business up to be less successful than if we do invest in our people when times are tough. What does that mean? Okay, so when you are uh, involved in a learning program, knowing that your company is investing in you when they may be slashing and burning in other areas, you know, I'm valued, I'm important, I feel like they need me and want me, they want to upskill me. Therefore, some of the output from that is I feel more, um, more loyal, I feel more creative, I feel more innovative, I want this to work. So actually, what are the things that get us out of economic hardship? Creativity loyalty, you know, innovation, 
So yeah. why would we not invest in our people when it is that times are tough? But unfortunately, I mean, I've been, I've been made redundant twice, once in 2007 when there was a crash then and uh, previous to that as well as fallout from, from 9-11 um, as a result of, um, you know, the economic downturns. And I've really, as a result, made myself valuable to any organization that I've worked with. And it's a little bit different now that I'm self-employed and have been for the last nine years, but, you know, people really need to understand what value do we bring. Now, if you're blending as a result of direct problems out of direct strategy, boom, you've got your answers right there. You know, yeah. to be able to say, you wanted to, them to sell six and they're now selling seven. You, mm -hmm. You're like, you're on a, a positive residual right there. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, you're getting us back to kind of the, the, the blended learning part. Are there any very, um, cause there's, you know, when we're blending our learning, it can mean a lot of different things. So you've mentioned videos for one, right? We've talked, uh, having, you know, just being virtual in a classroom, uh, you know, having regular classrooms with the biscuits and the coffee, but, um, you know, there's so, there's so many different technologies and you've mentioned a couple of times, uh, you know, social learning and, and all that kind of stuff as well. What are some of the more interesting or creative blends that you've either seen or heard about or, or implemented yourself as part of those solutions? I think it's about blending something that looks and feels like the organization. Um, and so the different technologies are tools in a toolkit. Don't get caught up on them. Don't think I must have video, I must have audio. Some things lend themselves to different things. So if you're explaining something that's potentially dangerous, like how not to fall off a ladder, an animation works really well because you don't want to film somebody falling off a ladder to do that. So an animation can really get that message across. And you know, audio, for example, for more long form that people might walk with, um, you know, a guided reflective practice, that, that would be a, a good opportunity. But I don't tend to get caught up on what, you know, what different tool it is. It's more about what is it that we're trying to solve. So I want to give you a story from um, from a TV channel in the UK. Um, it's in my book. And they had done the compliance e-learning. So they had e-learning. They ticked the box. 100% of people had gone through it. They were 100% compliant. No, they weren't. <laughs> so it was about anti-bribery and corruption. And they were still, you know, getting tickets for Wimbledon tennis and getting dinner reservations and things like that. And they were still taking them. And so they ended up in a bit of hot water about that. And the CEO said, well, come on, l and you know, what's going on here? And they said, well, we're 100 percent compliant. We tick the box. People understand this is wrong. No, they don't, because it was not something that they could really engage with. They were literally ticking a box. So the CEO said, no, this isn't this isn't acceptable. They really need to understand the consequences. So they engaged with an organization who designed learning for them that looked and felt like one of their TV shows. And suddenly everyone's interested in watching it. Everyone's interested in engaging with it. And so they had a hashtag, um, is it okay? And they took that directly from one of their TV shows. So it created a curiosity. They had a campaign around it. So it was that hashtag was all over everywhere. It was on the email banners. It was on their screensavers. And it created some sort of buzz around it. And then they had this learning program, which was essentially e-learning. But it was in the form of a TV show. And so that really plugged into the audience with what the audience would respond to. Um, but for some people, of course, um, that wouldn't work. You know, you couldn't have like a TV show style e-learning. It depends wholly on the context. So mm. think really carefully and think creatively about what is it the problem that you're trying to solve and who is it you're yeah. trying to solve it for. And the blend, the right blend will come to you um, because, you know, you'll be really understanding your audience. One thing I've always thought with um, sort of the standard or common approach of, uh, say, an e-learning module about those sort of ethical things, uh, anti-bribery, et cetera. I've always reminded that psychopaths have the ability to mimic the expected responses in their world. <laughs> Meaning, the, it, and the second thing that comes to mind is, you know, locked doors only keep the honest people, you know, out uh, of your home. So uh, be, just because someone responded successfully to the 10 question quiz or the 20 question quiz after sitting through, um, you know, a one hour module or something like that, doesn't mean that they're actually going to behave um, ethically. Yeah, yeah they got to feel it, hey? they got to mm. feel it for themselves. And I think that's one of the reasons why I really love VR, because mm. VR, you, you can't not feel it. I, in VR once, yeah. 
um, I, I, th there was a, there was a fire in the in the fake building I was in, you know, in the VR building I was in, and they said, "Oh, put the fire up, Michelle," and I used the wrong um, the wrong hose and blew the whole place up. And now I still carry that guilt today. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry that I burnt down a fake building. Um, but it's when you feel the learning. There's a question in the chat there from Richard about, do you use e-learning modules as part of your blended process? If it's appropriate, there's nothing wrong with e-learning. E-learning is great. It's fab. You know, it doesn't have to be the quiz at the end approach. You know, it doesn't have to be loads of words on a text. Um, e-learning by definition is just learning electronically. So howsoever that's formed, it, you know, it's great. Um, the question that you've put there, Richard, have you had much set success with these discrete pieces to the trainings. I'm not quite sure. I think that might be lost in a bit of, of translation, but the success of e-learning as part of a bigger picture enabled through sense making. Yes, there's huge success there. Um, there, there really is. But I don't want to go to the dark place that Chris just went to. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. What about so, training psychopaths? <laughs> yeah, let's let's go to the let's let's talk some of the practical stuff because of the first thing I heard when you said you know what they decided to do was to do a uh, a television show uh, you know and all that kind of stuff and the first thing that that what was ringing in my back of my head was the dollar signs right and the budget right and and I could probably uh, you know. It'd be very empathetic to some people in the chat thinking to themselves too, probably, yeah, but we don't have that kind of budget. We can't do yeah. a TV show for our training, you know? Uh, so, you know, that's got to come into the picture too. Of course it does. The right solution for the right problem, for the right people, the right time for the right reasons delivered in the right way. So Girl Guiding, there's a charity, got no money, got no money at all. But there's loads you can do with little money. If you've got creativity, and you've got the drive, you can really find it. So voicing over a PowerPoint, most people have got Microsoft as an option, haven't they? You know, mm -hmm. voicing over a PowerPoint, you can create a little animated video. It's not, you know, it just takes practice, it's not that hard. Creating a podcast, I'll learn tomorrow, my very first one that I'm gonna record in my new series, Learning From The Edges, is, is gonna happen, never done it before, no idea what I'm doing, learning as I'm going, but you know, it just takes the, the, the technology, set up Zoom and, and away you go. So I think yeah. working with the budget that you have, it's about the creativity and the creativity comes from the excitement you get when you really know your customer, when you really know the problem that they've got and plugging in how to solve it and help them be part of the solution. The best the best blends I've ever worked with is when we, we get, you know, right, we've all got a problem. What can we do about it? How can we brainstorm that? And you as a learning professional are bringing that adult learning theory, you're bringing the, the knowledge of learning design to a conversation about, well, what do we need to know and how can we get that, you know? It might just be getting your best expert and coaching them to teach other people in a way which is productive because one of the problems with using your experts internally is they're experts in their field they're not teachers they're not trainers they're not you know instructional designers so you're plugging together your expertise and their expertise to create something useful for somebody else mm -hmm. yeah i love it i think it's great i think i think when you when you start to realize that it becomes very easy and it does become fun and creative right you when you know listen i just need to figure out what it is that they're trying to do and then let's start with the technology that they have. And these are our constraints, right? And then yeah. and then maybe if they have an idea of the budget they can spend, maybe that's dropped into the mix too. So now you've got three things kind of guiding your creativity. What can we do with the technology that they currently have so we don't have to force them to buy any new stuff? Who are these people? What are we trying to do? What's the problem they're trying to solve? And kind of how much money do we have to work with that's 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 a perfect amount of constraints to be able to get really creative and say oh, you know okay here's a nice little blend of things we can do based on all of these three criteria right yeah and it means that that money that you're going to spend you already know the problem that you're trying to solve and what your outcomes will be so you can spend it a little bit more wisely than just throwing mud at the wall and hoping some of it yeah sticks. oh yeah or saying yeah that that amount of money is going to buy you probably about uh, three hours of uh, a workshop you know or something like that you know well, you might not you might not need a workshop hey it, yeah yeah, exactly. But I think that's where most people get to, right? It's like, well, let's see, e-learning costs this much per hour, classroom costs this much per hour, you know, all these other things, you know, and then and then people start just crunching the numbers on spreadsheets and then it's like, okay, well, let's buy one of these, two of these, four of these. Yeah. And that you're, should you're do trying, it. You're trying to climb on the horse the wrong way around. 
that's the way I see it. It's when you're starting with the solution, you're looking backwards, you know, you're looking at the tail, you're not actually looking at the head. And when you, you know, you're looking at the, 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 the business itself, the head of things, then, then you get the, the view the right way around. Mm -hmm. I'm loving the Swing your leg over the backside, not the front side. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you shouldn't even have a horse in the first place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe you need to be riding a donkey. Yeah, I'm loving what you just put in the chat there, the workshop that could have been an email so many <laughs> times, you know, the, the meeting that could have been a, a one line in a newsletter, um, that there's so many reasons why we just do what we've always done, not just mm. learning, but meetings, all sorts of things, isn't there? Can I just yeah. uh, approach that question um, from yeah. Paul? Do we think that the stakeholders just want more virtual and blended with virtual to save cost? I think yes is the answer because they're coming to you with a solution. So they may they may already have decided that we're gonna go virtual, not face-to-face -face because they think it's cost. But if you can offer that question around what does success look like, and you can start to dig into why, why that's um, potentially not the answer for them. It could be that you know they just want e-learning or they need e-learning or they just need the expert to talk to them for an hour or they just need a checklist of things to do. Um, but and, until we start talking about that solution driven, sorry, that success driven rather than solution driven approach, you'll never really know, um, you know, what, what the best options are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's a here's a different topic, but it, it kind of is part of this topic because I think it's part of a lot of people's blends. It's the whole concept of micro learning, not to go too far down a, a weird, you know, different topic, but but you know, it's a part of the blend, right? I see a lot of people talking about it. So maybe that's just uh, in our, in our remaining, you know, few minutes here together. What's, um, you know, do you think about it? Do you use it? Is it, is it part of the blend yeah. or, you know? It depends what you, you're defi de defining micro learning as in, in my definition, it's just a small intervention. Would that be the same? Are we talking the same thing here? I think I, I don't have one. I'm not. Yeah, I, I I would call it a buzzword and it's whatever you want it to be. So everybody yeah, wants yeah. it to be something different. So, yeah, I like yours. <laughs> I think I think it's important to, to, to define with your stakeholders what is you're talking about, actually. So, you know, I don't use the phrase micro learning particularly. For me, micro learning might be simply a checklist or mm. a, you know, a job aid or a, yeah. something. That or a bunch of small videos. And it's yeah, another exactly. it's another case like we were just talking about people coming the you know the, the client coming to you and saying we want to go virtual if they come to you and they say we want to use micro learning they're coming at it from probably a budget slash time savings you know kind of efficiency perspective they've heard the buzzword and said oh let's do five minute learning things take people out of the job less more less than you know than other learning options etc but truthfully there are many things that just sim simply cannot be learned. Um, in a very short period, you know, more complex tasks, et cetera. Um, and one thing I just, um, you've mentioned it a few times, and, and I think most folks in our group here probably have a sense of it. <laughs> see what I did there. Um, but you've mentioned sense making a couple of times. Um, and and, and uh, you, what, I'm, what I'm interpreting when you say that is, is something along the lines then of the, of the flipped classroom model where, um, you know, the, the learning of inform the present presentation of information happens ahead of the collective time, you know, together so that that collective time can then be used to discuss, process, elaborate on, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and I'm, I'm presuming that's that's how you're using the phrase then sense making. Yeah, that is. I mean, it's a perfect example of let's make sure everyone in the room is talking about the same thing when we're using these terms. Mm -hmm. um, in L&D, we've got a lot of terms that people outside of L&D, you know, let, let's be honest, people outside of L&D just don't care. They just <laughs> care, about, they care about the job they're paid for, sales or operations yeah. or finance or whatever. So we do need to be clear that we're all talking about the same thing. So, yeah, apologies on my point. No, no. I, should have, I should have made sense of sense making. But you're, <laughs> you know, you're using it, Chris, in the same way that I, I interpret it, too, that, um, you know, when we come together, it's about making what is theoretical and potentially abstract contextually relevant so you know i've told a story about a tv channel i've told a story about girl guiding you know those two things might be wholly uncontextually relevant to the audience today i hope that by telling those stories that they can do that sense making go oh yeah i can see mm -hmm. the link here you know i work with volunteers or i work with compliance and um, you know um, um but sometimes just even having a one-on-one -on -one or a small group you know so it might be a community of practice and it might be held on 
you know, a Teams channel or, a, a, you know, some sort of online enterprise uh, channel where people can come together and go, I heard this thing. What is it? You know, I don't know about you, but my my local kind of personal learning networks have all been full of chat GTP. Everyone's having a go. And I wrote this. I wrote this with chat GTP like it's some sort of hooray. I, I'm no longer viable as a human. Um, <laughs> I'm, no longer, I'm no longer necessary. Um, so, we, you know, it's just what does this mean for us? What does this mean for creating uh, learning design? What does this mean for micro learning? What does this mean for all of these things? So having a space to make sense of uh, the conversation is, is really important. Very cool. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful place for us to tie a bow on it and as a teaser, too, because we are going to be talking about chat GPT in the uh, near future. In a in a couple episodes, so fantastic segue, Michelle. Thank you so much, <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you for being here. Yes, this this itself has been a fascinating and, and, and fabulous conversation. I'm so glad that you were able to join us here today, um, folks. We're going to dance on out, but a couple of housekeeping things as we as we wrap up here. Don't forget, as always, that instructional designers and office of drinking coffee idiotic um, is brought to you by Domino Learning Systems, makers of the Domino One system for amazing authoring excellence uh, being a little facetious but you know uh brent and i are both uh, domino team members and if that's of interest to you i'm going to throw in a little link into the chat let um, us know and i was just going to say michelle go ahead and drop all your stuff in there but yep. you did that's awesome and hey uh you mentioned your podcast coming out soon if you've got a link for that drop that in there too we all definitely want to get subscribed and get ready for launch day since this is gaining some traction, going viral, here's my SoundCloud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, uh, it's so new, I've got a name, I'm on Twitter, uh, but that's all. Okay. Oh, well, that's good we're, enough. We're not Look there. for it, folks, look for it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, all, we'll all be staying informed and uh, as we go along, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing that come out. Yeah. Thanks again, Thanks Michelle. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everybody. Yep. As always, awesome time in the chat, too. We appreciate that so much, gang. See you, you guys all. are fantastic. It is a good time.